Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network and uh, very pleased to have Patrick Christ on today to talk about, uh, to do a listening session about the design of Vista 4.0. Um, just to let you guys know, this is going to be a fairly informal session. Um, we, you, there's the chat function, and you're welcome to send chats um, of thoughts, um, particularly as they relate to Nature's or Vista and its redesign, um, to either uh, Patrick and I or to all attendees. Um, you can also send in questions uh, through the question panel. Those are not public facing, although the chats can be. Um, and we welcome you to send in and feedback and comments and any thoughts you have. That's, that's the purpose of the session at any point. Um, we can also unmute you. Um, if you want to be unmuted, just raise your hand and I can unmute you that way. Um, and so then you could speak directly to Patrick and we'll, we'll have time for that at, toward at the end of like after his sort of initial presentation. We're also going to be doing some polls um, so for Patrick to get some feedback on some things along the way. Okay, Patrick, over to you. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, take advantage of the EBM Tools webinar session to do this. And uh, we got a perfect size uh, group for what we're trying to achieve here, as Sarah said. This really is a listening session. Um, that said, I do have uh, some presentation I'm gonna go through to just set the stage for where we've been and where we're planning to go. Um, and in particular, it's that where we're planning to go with this tool um, that is you know, what we're looking for to get a lot of input on. Um, this is our third listening session. We've had one uh, with the uh, General Conservation NGO and International Aid Group and also one with um, public land managers. Um, so this one we're really uh, looking to get input from coastal marine practitioners in particular. So um, with that, I'll get moving. This is just on the title slide here. Um, you can see our tagline for VISTA conservation on the land, in the water, anywhere on the globe. So it's agnostic about um, what sort of environment it works in. And I just like to acknowledge um, our funders over the years down below. We've had a total of um, about four and a half million dollars over the years in uh, development and we have an endowment um, for VISTA, uh, which is why we're here um, 14 years after our first release. So with that, um, uh, Sarah already gave some instructions. Again, this is being recorded, um, mostly just so that uh, we can go back and listen to, to questions and comments. Um, in terms of agenda, I'm gonna do a quick overview about what our current version, the three series, does. Um, that won't be a live demo or anything. Um, there are um, uh, EBM tool webinars that have used Vista um, in the library of past webinars. So if you're interested, you can uh, look up those. Um, I want to talk about what we've learned from some uh, surveys that we've done um, over the last six months or so, um, and then really focus on that concept for Vista 4.0 and the workflow. So uh, you can get a, a good idea of what we're really thinking about at this stage. Um, again, nothing set in stone um, about this, so that's what we want input on. And again, we'll um, have a variety of ways of feedback, including uh, six polls that Sarah will run live during the session. Um, you can feel free to um, you know, put in your comments and questions, and it's fine for Sarah to interrupt me uh, with those so we can do them in a timely way. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end as well for it just to be a bit more freeform. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, so VISTA was funded originally to support this mission of getting biodiversity consideration into um, various types of planning that people do um, in different environments and different purposes. Um, so to meet that mission, we wanna keep this tool um, effective and accessible and up to date. Um, as I mentioned, it's been out there for 14 years, but um, even though we have the endowment to keep it maintained after that long, it's really just time to modernize it from the ground up. And that gives us an opportunity to do some rethinking um, about what it does and how it does it. Um, and we've gained a lot of experience over these years um, using VISTA ourselves on all of our assessment and planning projects um, for the benefit of others. And again, a lot of disparate environments and types of organizations and purposes, but we're really interested in hearing from uh, people representing um, what the market uh, would be for the tool and um, really what they think about where we're going with it. 
So um, Siri can kick off our first poll. It should show up now. Let's see. Yeah, it's up. Okay. All right, our responses are starting to come in. Can you see it, Patrick? The yeah, I can. Okay. It says we're at nine of 19. Okay. Um, I, I'm not going to vote, um, okay. although we do have 19 attendees in okay. addition to us. So okay. we'll just maybe give it three more seconds or so. Just choose your best answer. All right. I think we'll probably assume there's some that, that um, aren't going to vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those are the results. Okay, good, thanks a lot. Okay. All right, should be down. All right. Yep. Oops, okay. Um, so just a bit about what Vista is now. Um, so it's currently an extension to ArcGIS. Uh, we just put out an Arc 10.6 platform um, version of it. Um, you know, we describe it as this broadly capable tool um, in terms of that ability to integrate um, you know, assessment and planning um, in a lot of different activities in the land and water, also usable by a variety of skill levels um, with the idea that, you know, one person may not use every function in it because it's a pretty big tool, um, but uh, different people at different levels can pick up different parts of it pretty easily. Uh, we also uh, provide and will continue to provide full um, help and a variety of services around it um, and we've had um, some you know thousands of downloads and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, in terms of what Vista does, um, I won't read all through these questions but really focus on the key components. Um, so first one we currently call conservation elements. We're probably going to shift a lot of our jargon and that'll become targets um, but uh, also multi-objective so they can be you know, ecological things, but also desirable human uses and cultural features and, and pretty much anything you want. Um, but, you know, uh, where are they? Um, you know, uncertainty information, you can get into a lot of pattern analysis like richness and um, confidence and diversity and things like that. The other major component are scenarios. Um, so, uh, these are basically collections of maps that represent what's going on in the land, air, and water um, currently and in possibly in the future um, that represent those things that can affect your elements for better or worse. And then there's the evaluations when you put those two things together where you can really get into, you know, how are my uh, elements or targets doing now? How might they be doing in the future? Am I going to meet my retention goals? Um, if not, what's causing the problems and where and, and how might I act um, to mitigate those things? So um, some things that are somewhat unique about um, Vista or, or notable. Um, one is that we didn't invent this out of nothing. We really uh, were seeking to support a variety of pretty common frameworks out there. You can see EBM being one, but things like cumulative effects assessment and systematic conservation planning um, and so on. Um, another is that um, it is a big tool because it supports this idea of complete life cycle planning. So moving through your data gathering and expert knowledge integration through assessment and developing alternatives, um, developing, you know, ultimately the plan you want to implement, um, and then actually tracking or monitoring implementation of your plan and conducting adaptive management. You can also work at multiple scales. Um, so different than um, tools, say like MarkSan, where you intersect your data with a fixed site unit or planning unit, um, and then you just uh, work at that level. Vista uh, lets you work with your data at its source resolution, and you can uh, move among you know different scales. So you can specify your output um, pixel size, for example. Um, you do take a pretty big computing hit compared to the other kind of tools that work with sites um, for that luxury. But there are, are also aspects to Vista that also use that site unit um, function as well. Um, and then I mentioned this before, you know, you can work across any of these environments and across all three simultaneously. And I think that's somewhat unique as well. So uh, just to get into what it does now, 
Um, so again, you have elements or targets, um, maps of them, values, expert knowledge about their requirements, and responses to stressors and conservation actions. You can combine them in a number of ways into what we call conservation value summaries, where basically um, different indices of value. You can then characterize um, any number of scenarios, um, both in terms of physically what's going on in the land, air, and water, but also policy or causal mechanisms behind those things. Um, so we often think of, you know, baseline of current situation and other trends like, you know, build out, climate change, invasive species spread, um, whatever. Um, so VISTA is not modeling those things. You do that elsewhere and then you can integrate them into VISTA. Um, and then ultimately your scenarios will contain your alternatives and your plan. Um, VISTA then, when you do scenario evaluation, intersects your elements and your scenarios together and applies a couple different cumulative effects models that are available. So you get all of your different map and um, quantitative tabular outputs from that, which is um, a pretty extensive set, but they're pretty nicely organized hierarchically. Um, and then you can get into exploration and planning. And so, you know, you can go into the the areas of red blobs, which you can probably guess mean not good things are happening there. And you can see what uh, elements are there and how they're responding to the features within the scenario at those locations. Um, and then you can turn it around into a planning tool. So for individual site areas, you can specify what you want to do there and then back to the policy type, how you actually want to implement it. So that's all saved um, out into um, uh, GIS shapefiles now. Um, so you can do that, you know, site by site. Um, we also have a wizard that interoperates with MarkSan. And so instead of, you know, kind of whack-a-mole problem over here, you can run your solution and then bring it into this planning and policy environment. So you can refine the spatial design of your network and again, specify what you want to have happen there and how you want to accomplish it. Um, so there's a lot of little details, um, you know, in there, but just this is a pretty complete view um, of what Vista does today. And again, just supporting adaptive management cycle. So it has some built-in functions where if you um, swap out a better data set or, you know, somebody proposes a, you know, a new use, maybe a marine wind farm, um, all of a sudden, you know, you can very nimbly um, change any of those things very quickly on the fly, as well as any of the, the science that goes in here um, and refresh your analyses very quickly, which might suggest changes to your plan that you can also make quickly. Um, so we don't um, tend to just use Vista, even though it's a really broad tool. And I just want to explain to people, we have a pretty strong concept about toolkits. Here's one we developed for integrated land sea planning, just highlighted, you know, Vista in red, but, you know, some of the other tools that we tend to bring together. And that's a concept we um, definitely plan on continuing into our redesign and getting even more explicit about some of the interoperability with other tools um, as funding um, is available. So let's um, go ahead and move into surveys. Um, so I'll just point out, um, we did a, you know, some of what you'll see is a survey of our VISTA registrants from last August. Um, early this year, we did a survey of those same VISTA registrants, but we invited a lot of other people, including uh, everybody from the EBM Tools Network was invited um, to participate in that survey. Um, so I'll uh, show some of the results. So first of all, uh, this is, is already a little bit dated because um, uh, we get, you know, a handful of new registrants every week, but uh, downloads by country. So um, I think it's probably up to like 37 countries now. Uh, you can see the U.S. So these are proportional. The size of the box is proportional to the number of registrants. Um, overall, the U.S. Um, biggest by far, but you can um, get an idea of where else we're seeing a lot of um, Vista downloads. All right, um, for those of you that are uh, US based, um, you can just see within the US um, and territories, again, proportionally, um, Texas, California, Florida, Colorado are the big four in there, but um, 43, again, it's probably, may have changed, but 43 um, of the US states and territories have had downloads. Um, industry types, so these are, are what industry people claim um, that they work for. Uh, so again, quite a big 
breadth um, of different sectors uh, that have been downloading Vista with conservation environmental uh, the most, not uh, surprisingly, and education um, behind that. And then uh, we ask people when they register what their intended uses of Vista are. Again, quite a large variety of things um, that people have indicated. Um, um, actually, academic and research is the number one, uh, closely followed by conservation planning and management. All right, so then we started to get into questions to guide us in the redevelopment. So um, a key one for us is what platform uh, that we should build this on. Again, it's currently um, ArcGIS 10.6. Um, you can see that there's a majority um, that were ESRI based um, here. We're definitely taking a strong look at um, ArcGIS Pro um, to take advantage of its 64-bit. Um, processing and it's it's really the platform Esri is going to be supporting um, longer into the future. Um, a lot said QGIS and we're very cognizant um, that a lot of uh, the developing world um, in particular um, is uh, using QGIS and, and often exclusively uh, so we're we're not going to ignore that. Um, we did let people you know, respond with more than one, basically. You know, they could have said, I, I could use either um, of these just fine. Um, next question we asked was, what level of workflow support? And what we mean by that is, you know, kind of how wizarded or guided the workflow should be. And what we said is currently we took a middle of the road approach where, um, you know, there's some um, guidance in there, but we don't really have a prescriptive workflow in it. Um, so we asked people about that and, you know, most said that's about right, that, um, you know, we, we don't want it just to be, a, you know, don't know where to start, kind of a black box, but we also don't want it to be really rigid um, either. And so, you know, majority opinion there, some people said even less prescriptive, you know, smaller uh, groups said more prescriptive. In terms of um, planning support, so this is, you know, focus on biodiversity versus what we'd call multi-objective applications, which would, you know, say integrate conservation with human use and development. Um, we essentially said, you know, VISTA was designed with a focus on biodiversity, but it's proven to be quite flexible for multi-objective, although not, you know, there's not much in it that's explicitly multi-objective. So you can see kind of um, pretty much equal between, you know, current approach works well versus this should be even more explicitly multi-objective um, in its support and, you know, some, some more minority opinions there. Um, so some general suggestions people had, uh, you know, one thing we noticed was that there were conflicting results between having it more user friendly and guided versus more flexible for power users. So you'll you'll definitely see how we're um, planning on addressing that. Um, another was focusing on incorporating the open standards for the practice of conservation. Um, I'm guessing most people on this call are familiar with that, but if not, you can just Google open standards and conservation. Um, it's a great set of online standards and a framework and tools. Um, so again, you can see how we're addressing that. Um, make sure it reveals trade-offs in multi-objective planning. So VISTA does that now, um, if used properly. Um, and again, we'll plan on continuing that. Um, we definitely have had survey results over the years saying it is hard to get started with VISTA. So uh, there was encouragement to um, provide what we're calling starter data packages, if possible. Um, making the model more flexible to represent concepts like landscape health rather than um, you know this focus on specific elements or targets like this habitat that species fully incorporating ecosystem services uh, explicitly incorporating climate change um, so vista was designed before this was something really any of our clients were requesting um, and since then we incorporate climate change on virtually every project. And again, VISTA has proven very flexible and robust to doing both vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning, but um, it's definitely been on our wish list to make that more explicit. Um, confidence information, so it's very limited um, in VISTA right now. It's again, been on our wish list to incorporate that broadly 
um, throughout the tool as well as the ability to calculate uncertainty in the results. Um, and then finally, um, this one's a little bit fuzzy, but um, you know, when you do the analyses in VISTA, you get a lot of maps, you get a lot of reports, and uh, if there could be more emphasis on helping the user make more meaning out of it uh, would be uh, great. And again, that's as a planner, that's been on my list as well. Um, so in terms of specific functions, uh, you know, keep the ability to specify site level changes, but enhance it as a planning tool. Um, maintain interoperability with Markzan um, or prioritization tools generally. Provide a simple model to incorporate species demographics. Provide more information to guide planning by ranking stressors and conservation practices. Um, so that's, you know, again, uh, when you're trying to come up with solutions. Um, there's a lot of information in VISTA. Um, it just needs to be presented uh, more effectively to planners, I think. Um, incorporate this, you know, basic ability to input and calculate cost information. So that's kind of on the simple side. And then more advanced might be interoperability with a return on investment package. Um, and one person um, generally responded to everything. It already does a lot, keep it simple. Um, but that, that's not really how we roll, so um, sorry. Um, so let me get into now how we're responding to all of that. Um, so first, just some key concepts. Um, I'll say we had a retreat, so um, the VISTA team, some other people from NatureServe, some people from the Natural Heritage Network uh, locked ourselves um, away for a few days and looked at this um, information and, and drew on our own knowledge. And, and generally, you know, we concluded the fundamentals of what it does are still what it should do. Those basics of there are things that I care about. I want to know how they're doing now. I want to know how they might be doing under future scenarios. And I want to be able to design responses to that. So what it does now, it seems very fundamental to all planning. Um, so hallmarks of our direction, better, faster, more. Um, easier to get started and more flexible. Um, and then I'll just give you the caveat as we move through the rest of this, that this is a vision. Um, we're going to take feedback from these sessions. Um, we're going to probably modify some things. Um, and of course, it's going to be a big wish list and we'll have some initial trade-offs. But um, again, with our endowment and hopefully with some additional partners um, in development, we'll be able to knock off more things um, off that wish list in, in the coming years. Um, so some key concepts, who is it for? Uh, well, basically, you know, all those that seek to integrate biodiversity with spatial assessment and planning needs globally and in any environment. Um, again, that's basically what it is now. Um, we didn't see a need to change that. Um, uh, cost, okay, so Vista um, initially cost quite a bit, um, and then we made it free in 2009. Um, we've decided uh, that we would like to um, follow the model of Marathi. so if you're familiar with that tool, um, they've got a affordable sliding scale um, for that. And so we'll, um, in the poll that's coming up, we'll present what we're thinking about for that. We'd love to get your input on it. Um, so again, while we have an endowment, um, it's basically enough to keep it running, but not enough really to do a lot of enhanced um, functions, support, outreach, um, you know, online uh, help and things like that that we'd like to do. So we're looking to augment um, our endowment with uh, some licensed revenue. Um, in terms of support, um, we offer a lot already. Um, so we're planning to enhance the ease of getting up and running more quickly, and we'll, we'll d delve into that quite a bit. Um, we're going to continue to offer our training support, um, other services, um, hopefully boost these free online help assets, and then um, people encouraged us to add a, you know, it could be an additional cost service option for prepackaging data, again, to help people get started. So um, Sarah's gonna go ahead and launch a couple polls now. So for this one again, uh, just whatever is the best answer. Okay, That's looks like good. it's topped out, yeah. Okay.
that good? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can okay. move on to the next one. Okay. And so this one again is about the um, license fees. And if you don't view yourself as a user, if you can just imagine with your organization, um, you know, what's the best answer? Good. Yes, yes, that is good. Um, and I'll point out, um, I don't know if we had it in a slide, uh, Sarah, I can't remember, but um, as a thank you for participating in this, we are gonna pick somebody um, randomly that attended and um, award you with a free one-year license when Vista 4.0 is released. Again, keep in mind it's free right now. You can just go and download it. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, did you wanna go on to the next one or is it? Uh, no, it was okay. um, three, two, and three. Okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah, we did did cover the support, right? Uh, no, we haven't done the support. Oh, one. okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and do the support one. Sorry about that. Um, so again, this uh, it, even if you don't think you're going to be the user, if you could try to imagine in your organization what you would need. Now you can answer more than one uh, choice on here, so just check all that apply. That's probably good. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, oh, we got somebody else. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, so moving on. Um, next one is uh, that big question about software platforms. So first I'll say uh, we're still investigating options. With this, um, as you know, it has been an Esri tool. Um, right now, what we're going to just put out there to get your reaction is we're planning on um, Esri Arc Pro. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's the 64-bit processing, but um, and also it's going to be the platform of choice for Esri to move forward over the years. Um, and also with Esri, there's just a huge code library. So the first version of Vista cost a couple million dollars to build. Um, you know, 15 years ago, uh, for a quarter of that, we think we can build a bigger, more powerful tool because there's a lot of things we had to custom code originally that are now just off the shelf that we can put together. Um, but part of the plan is is for us to um, code a lot of this um, in Python and make the interfaces more agnostic, um, so not so heavily Esri um, dependent. Um, and we're hoping that, if not initially over time, that'll make it more flexible to interact with other Python-based um, programs, um, so open source um, and web-based platforms. So that's the idea. It'll be our objective to make this as flexible um, as possible, but just imagine it's gonna be an extension to um, Arc Pro um, out of the gate. Um, so I think I pretty much covered um, what I was going to on this slide. And so let's go ahead and do the poll on that. And again, this is a um, single best answer. Okay, good? Yeah, that's fine. All right, thanks. All right, not surprising, still kind of a mixed bag. We understand that. Um, all right, so let's start to get into functionality. Um, and so, um, you know, as I said, generally what it does now seems relevant. 
Um, what we're thinking of doing is having a core set of analyses that will be quicker and easier for people to generate outputs um, from that. So that getting up and started more quickly, um, really building up the planning tools within it, um, and much more extensive integration of confidence information and uncertainty analyses, more explicit support on the monitoring and adaptive management side. And then as I mentioned before, um, you know, sticking with that toolkit approach, you'll be able to see um, as I get closer to the end, um, some of the tools that we're thinking of having more explicit interoperability with. So um, now I'd like to move into the workflow. Um, so these are gonna be your um, classic sort of box and arrow diagrams, but I'll first start off saying this isn't a workflow, but I just wanted to um, give you this concept that for each of the main um, task areas in Vista, we're thinking um, that we'll probably have a simplest version of the core function, um, another level of it where you can maybe add an additional attribute or some analyses, and then something much more advanced um, that might uh, bring an external tool into it. And so you can look at any of these pathways, um, you know, so for example, on scenarios, um, maybe there's a basic gap analysis that then in a more advanced mode goes into a, a, a much deeper cumulative effects assessment. But whichever level you take, you're going to end up at the end with decision products. Um, and again, you'll always be able to revisit these things over time so you can start simple and get more complex as you get more um, data, time, resources, comfort, um, et cetera. So now getting into the conceptual workflow, um, just to give you a quick view about legend. And so first thing I wanna mention um, here is that, um, again, for the open standards people, we are looking at building a pretty strong connection to the tools around open standards that can feed in at the high level of a, you know, developing a Vista project. So one is, um, you know, pulling out from the Esri interface would be having our own um, interface that's kind of a master project dashboard. And that would be where your targets, goals, objectives, and so on. Um, again, some things coming out of here, but not requiring that. So if you don't use those tools, you can simply create those things um, through the tools within Vista or import them. All right, next we get into target representation. So there will of course be external inputs. This is just software, um, you know, it doesn't come with data. Again, we'll look at um, uh, maybe eventually some clip zip ship uh, data packages downloads, but we're also thinking about providing some um, connections out to some uh, known vetted global and um, at least uh, like US or North American uh, data sets again, so people don't have to go hunting on their own. Um, so target representation basically is about, you know, uh, your targets distribution and attributes and then combining your targets into pattern value analyses. Uh, so thinking again about overlays, weighted overlays, that sort of thing. Um, the next group, um, again, start to recognize this scenario mapping. Um, so at the simpler end would be, you know, your managed or protected areas that can just be drawn right in from those protected area databases out there. Um, but also, you know, I mentioned this idea of um, letting people uh, get away from, you know, the fixed sort of target idea more into more of a landscape health concept. So being able to bring in existing calculated metrics um, that exist out there that uh, we can import and act on. And then there'd be the complete scenarios like we have now that um, is a, a detailed, robust way of representing scenarios. So um, again, there, there might be um, existing things that would, we would import, but also maybe some interoperability with other tools that can do dynamically calculated metrics, but also say for ecosystem services, those things could become targets in the tool. Um, and by the way, uh, Sarah, again, if um, questions pop up, feel free to interrupt me as okay. we go. Um, so now that we have targets and scenarios, we can get into target condition and goals assessment. So again, starting simply things like a gap analysis 
that could then lead into maybe irreplaceability, um, metrics condition assessment, um, cumulative effects assessment. Uh, we can also start to bring in things like that simple demographics, species demographics calculations, um, and the ability to compare across scenarios, which is, is not um, seamless with VISTA right now. And then with all that, we can then be doing planning. Um, so uh, certainly you know, integration of our assessment results and then being able to explore those results like you do now. Um, prioritization, which is supported currently through uh, MarkSan, but um, broadening that. Um, connectivity, um, so again, maybe uh, bringing that in more explicitly. And then um, some differences we talked about as a team between site planning and area planning, so maybe some different functionality to support those things because they're, um, they're fairly different. And then I had mentioned the cost and return on investment was a recommendation, so we're hoping to bring that in as well. Um, so these task areas so far are already supported more or less in VISTA. This would be a new area um, where really not much of this is currently supported. Um, other than VISTA's currently reporting functions, but it might include things like letting you set an update um, schedule for your inputs, um, more explicit ability to monitor your plan implementation, maybe setting up trigger actions in your monitoring, um, you know, being able to bring in, you know, field evaluation of um, effectiveness of your actions um, and integrate that into the system. Uh, you know, more readily identifying conflicts as they're emerging. Um, and then uh, people had requested more time series uh, support. Um, again, we need to flesh out what some of this is gonna look like, of course. Uh, but those are the kind of functions that we're thinking of supporting. And then finally, there's how you get it out there. Um, and of course, right now you can take anything out of this and you can put it up online. Um, we might build some specific pipelines into systems like landscope.org. Um, that's operational in the US. Um, and then again, probably an overtime thing might be supporting some of what we're calling the, you know, the startup or lighter kinds of analyses that can be supported online um, through some sort of a portal. So that's the first look at the workflow. I've got um, a few different versions of these just to communicate some different aspects. Um, this one here is really more about outputs. So I'm not going to read all through it, but just illustrating, you know, with some current Vista screenshot. So target representation and overlay. So here's an example of an overlay map. We're going from light green to dark green as, you know, uh, say lower diversity to higher diversity. Um, there's the scenario mapping part of that. So, you know, again, being able to take data from a lot of different sources representing what's physically going on out there or modeled to happen at some point in the future proposed and bringing that in together into a scenario um, data stack. Um, condition assessment. Um, so again, um, just to, uh, you know, I think is mostly focused on that now. So, you know, things like um, an index of conflict um, between your targets and um, your scenario, um, as well as your quantitative reporting of how you're doing against uh, your representation goals, for example. So uh, we'll have a lot of the same stuff um, and probably more on top of that. And then um, planning functions. Um, so just, you know, quick thing here, just representing the interoperability with MarkSan. Um, for example, that's from the California coast. Adaptive management, um, I don't have a graphic for that, but just uh, more about, um, you can see uh, a lot of reports and stats uh, are primarily what we're talking about from that. Um, and again, your outputs. Okay, so one thing I wanted to highlight here within this is this idea of the quick start um, functions. And so we highlighted these in purple. Um, to really talk about how we want to support people, you know, maybe connecting in with those national global um, data sets on um, ecosystems and so on, being able to more rapidly get their targets into the tool that then could prompt them that they now have data allowing them to do target overlay. Would they want to do that? Um, and first I'll say, there'll be, we're planning on letting you just turn off the guidance part. So again, the first time, even if you're a power user, you might want that guidance just to help you walk through it um, and then say, okay, I got it, I'm gonna turn this off. 
Um, so again, leading, you know, from that, um, you know, being able to bring in again a protected area database to have just a simple protected area scenario that would allow you to then develop that gap analysis, which could then calculate irreplaceability. Um, you might want to take the next step of importing some metric layers that would allow you to get into target condition and landscape health kind of concepts. Um, and then, you know, at that point, you probably could have enough to just do some basic planning and that might just be plan for new protected areas based on your gap analysis and irreplaceability, for example. So you could actually develop that scenario um, and bring it over here and then your monitoring side could be reporting out, um, you know, how much more goal achievement um, you've uh, done by, you know, creating that um, plan, for example. Patrick, there is a question. Um, mm -hmm. Could you define what you mean by adaptive management? Early it sounded like a continuing management process. Now it sounds like traditional adaptive management, which is application and experimental form monitoring and seeing what works best. Um, yeah, we're we're considering that um, pretty broadly. So, but I'd, I'd lump it um, into three categories, essentially. One is from the more technical side, which I talked about earlier with Vista 3, which is just if I get new information, I can quickly update my analyses and understand if I need to make changes um, in my uh, plan um, based on uh, new data, new science um, coming in, or again, somebody messes up our plan and says, you know, we're gonna ram some new infrastructure or energy development right where you were hoping to achieve a lot of your, your target goals. Um, so there's that part. And then um, the other two parts, one is what we call, um, monitoring and adapting to plan implementation itself. So, you know, we put out a plan, how well are we doing and actually putting it into place um, on the ground in the sea um, kind of thing. And, you know, if we're not achieving things, you know, uh, what does that mean? Um, were we too ambitious? Do we need to look at different techniques and so on? Not that Vista supports all of that decision-making. Some of that, you know, I think is pretty well supported up here, like in tools like Marathi. Um, so that, again, is kind of the toolkit idea. The other one is that effectiveness monitor, monitoring and adaptive management. So we're actually putting those things into place um, out there in the field, but they're not having the effect that we wanted, um, say, in restoration. And so what should we do about that? Um, you know, different area, different tactics um, kind of thing. So um, if that didn't answer the question, then, um, yeah, maybe they can repose it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Okay. All right, um, and finally, I'm gonna pop this up and I'm not gonna walk all through this, thankfully. Um, so uh, you can see those same purple things here and then we've just added boxes um, for these function areas. So these bigger boxes are the task, smaller boxes are the functions. We'll be you know, breaking those down into even more detail. Um, but I did wanna just highlight where we're starting to talk more about um, potential interoperability. So Mark Zan, uh, you know, we'll be looking at Mark Sand with zones, at zonation, um, ROI, um, and again, you know, you can also comment to us about specific tools you think we should really um, pay attention to, you know, over here on the ecosystem services side, um, but this, this is the big picture now of our intention um, for Vista. So I'm going to come back to this, um, but I uh, one, I think we're going to move on to a poll next. So this is basically just the gut sense of how this thing is is hitting you right now. And again, just pick the best answer. Okay, sure. All right. Um, yeah. 
thought we'd get a couple more, but that's um, that's good. Well, glad to see the majority can't wait to use it. Me too. Um, I'll put me in that camp. Um, and uh, good to see, you know, people would recommend it and, and also that people have suggestions, um, which is what we're really, you know, looking to get out of this. So, uh, yeah, we can go ahead and Okay, and if I cut it off much prematurely, you can just you could send in your response via chat, so Patrick would get it. Okay. okay. Um, so in terms of next steps, and and I'm going to pop that graphic back up, like I promised, just so we can open it up and and happy to take verbal uh, interaction as well. So what we're going to do, we're completing these listening sessions um, at middle of next month. Um, we're going to summarize what we learned um, and adjust. Um, uh, as a relevant, um, and then uh, we'll get into engineering. I, you know, some people have probably heard of this agile development process, which is is more of sort of build, test, build, test, build, test. Um, so uh, kind of build it in pieces. Um, that can represent another opportunity if you're really interested in working with us further. Um, that could include participating in some. Um, web meetings where we'll get into a particular task area and the engineers will demonstrate, you know, what they're doing with it and we can give them feedback at that time. And, you know, when we get a critical mass of functions, we'll also be looking for um, beta testers. So if you're interested in that, um, you can also let us know. Um, and then, of course, there's always that fun stuff like uh, rewriting the entire 350 page Vista manual from the ground up. Um, web content and so on, and right now a target release of June of next year. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you'd like to be entered um, for that uh, free license for a year when we get to that release stage, um, you can just go ahead and say enter and put your uh, email address um, in the chat there and um, Sarah will pass those on to us and we'll throw a dart and pick one. Okay, and you can send it just to panelists if you want it to remain private. Okay. okay. Um, so in terms of discussion, again, we're happy to take uh, any and all questions, comments, and suggestions. Um, but uh, of course, you know, any core tasks that you think are lacking that we we somehow missed, um, anything you think is unnecessary, and why it might be that you know that that task area is handled really well by this other tool, and you know, please give us the name of it. Um, any comments about this idea of the quick start approach? Those would be, you know, more of that heavily guided but can turn it off guidance functionality to really walk you through step by step an initial set of analyses. Um, any comments on the way we're proposing it should work um, or anything at all? And there's my email address. You can feel free to contact me at any time in the future after the fact. And then I'll, I'll just mention again that we do have this concept of major adopters. Um, so this would be an organization, say, that um, is thinking that they would want to use this pretty ubiquitously in their organization and would like to become a partner um, in funding and development, but also giving them that seat at the design table um, and we'll most likely, you know, come up with uh, some uh, system to give them a nice break on license fees. Um, so um, I'll stop there and just put our uh, workflow back up. Um, people can mull this over and then Sarah, let me know if we have any questions. Well, there was one comment so far. Um, it's, it's, it was just a comment, but difficult to see where community-based participation fits into the framework. So you might want to talk about that. Um, very good. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we do have um, our current toolkit model is more explicit about that with Vista in terms of um, communi uh, sorry, community engagement or civic engagement um, kind of tools. And so, you know, basically, um, that engagement happens at a few stages, um, for sure. One is, you know, I'd say is more in this upfront process of just deciding, you know, what are our issues, what are our objectives um, for this area, for this planning, um, what do we want to get out of it? And that's where, you know, you learn things like, uh, gee, us scientists thought we had a good handle on what the important ecological targets are, but, you know, people want to make sure that things that we don't think are necessarily all that important um, 
you know, maybe are more common are still represented in the analyses and planning the things they see more in their backyards or whatever. So, um, so it, it happens there. Um, it certainly happens in the, the goals of what do we want our future to look like. Um, so that could bring in um, both, you know, the, the things we're worried about, those stressors we want to mitigate, but also turning that around into more of a multi-objective um, planning um, sense, you know, which gets back to the targets about, you know, other uh, desirable economic activities, cultural uses um, and features and things like that. Um, and then certainly when you get into planning mode where you're digesting the results of analyses and you're uh, developing options um, is where, uh, you know, some of this um, does operate in a reasonably nimble uh, thing that you could do in a public setting and, and let people be propose, proposing actions in particular areas and looking at those on the fly um, of what benefits they may have or, or maybe non-target impacts they might have. So. Um, it's, yeah, we didn't make it explicit in here. I think it's a good suggestion for us to think about how we draw that out, but it, it's inherent in all of this. Okay. Another question, would it be possible to get an international version of VISTA? Current terminology is squarely USA based. There might get, uh, there might be more international uptake if terminology was harmonized with international terminology. Um, good. We're hoping um, that we achieve that in a couple ways. One is, um, again, we've been encouraged to adopt as much the open standards um, jargon as possible, which is is definitely international. Um, I have, you know, looking through their glossary, um, it's still a little bit lacking for the kinds of things we do. It wasn't really designed so much around spatial assessment and planning, so we do need to fill in the blanks. Um, we will, again, be very happy to take suggestions for jargon um, terminology. The other thing we're thinking about doing, too, is um, letting you actually change it in VISTA. So wherever, uh, you know, we use a particular term, maybe it's target, you want to use feature uh, or something like that. So you could just wholesale change that both in the interfaces as well as the outputs. So that's that's on the wish list to do that. Okay, um, another question. I'd like to know more about the quick start concept. Does it make it easier to use or how does it help? I would find a scoping, scoping in quotes, level of detail helpful, uh, i.e. simplified input data to get a sense of what your scenario outputs might look like, but less labor intensive than is going than going through the whole process. Is that possible? Is there a Vista light? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure I fully understood the, the comment, but definitely what we're intending in terms of the startup, um, I guess could begin pretty far upstream with having more online resources about how to get it started. We're thinking of kind of a, a templating idea for different sectors. Um, so if you are doing kind of straight up systematic conservation planning versus um, long range transportation planning um, or, you know, broad sort of community multi-objective planning, you know, what that startup might look like. Um, and then, moving into um, the idea again of having some built-in um, connections to some existing, you know, for the U.S., you know, data sets, um, global data sets um, that, uh, again, instead of hunting around for data on your own, it would already have uh, some help in bringing data in more easily. Um, and then once you're into the tool and you've got data in there, the idea that it's just has a lot more of that wizard type of guidance built into the interfaces, again, that you can turn off if it's bugging you. We don't want the paperclip if people remember the obnoxious Microsoft paperclip. <laughs> Definitely don't want to do that. But some guidance that basically, um, you know, starts you off with, hey, step one, is enter your targets. You know, once you get more than one target, bringing up the, you know, would you like to do target overlay um, kind of thing. And then, you know, once you have that, um, would you like to assess, um, 
you know, whether you use the gap analysis term or you use something else, but would you like to conduct a gap analysis of how well your targets are protected? If so, you know, you need a protected area scenario. Would you like to import data for that? So literally we're thinking about that level of walking people through um, with that sort of help in the interface, you know, and pop-ups along the way that will step them through you know, again, you've now that you've got that data, would you like to do this analysis? Now that you've done that analysis, would you like to, you know, do this other function? So again, it might be, you know, now that you've conducted a gap analysis, would you like to um, develop a um, scenario of additional protected areas? So um, I don't know if we can unmute whoever asked that if if that is making sense. Uh, I will, let me give it a try. And Paul, you are unmuted now if you did want to. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we yes. can. Great. Uh, yeah, I think that, I think that really helps. Uh, I'm basically uh, intimidated by using something like Vista and, you know, in the past having, um, inadequacies of data is always a problem because you go through this process that you're not familiar with, try to put in data, and then in the long run you find out you really don't have adequate data or, or adequate understanding of how the process works. So it would be really nice just to get have some basic parameters that, are, that kind of point you in the right direction and give you an idea of what your output would look like. And, uh, you know, start from there. And then if you could do a few scenarios that way, um, you'd only have to go into the detail for your selected scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And we, and we get that feedback a lot. Um, it's always a challenge building a decision support system, especially in something very technical like GIS, uh, because we, we don't want the situation where we're um, just making it easier for people to do dangerous um, things. But, um, you know, there's always that requirement that people do understand the data they're using and what they're trying to achieve uh, with it. I I've, I've certainly have horror stories of people that, you know, picked it up and just push buttons like it was artificial intelligence. Um, and then, of course, got a lot of garbage um, back out of it. So we, you know, there's only so much we can do about mitigating those problems. Um, and again, you know, it's expected that, you know, you are working with subject matter experts. Um, you know, along the way, like any any good planning process. I mean, it's something I I emphasize. You know, Vista doesn't really require anything that isn't required in any good planning process. It just hopefully makes it a lot easier um, to move through it, and of course, you know, tracks everything you do and allows you to document everything you do. So it's all very repeatable, um, easily updatable, and all of that sort of stuff. But you know, once you've you know your experts are kind of involved you know, mostly in these, these early parts, um, you know, once you get over into these areas here, um, you know, again, hopefully with enough documentation and handoff, you can have people doing intelligent um, things, especially, you know, just like site planning. You know, I just, I wanna move around to sites where we've got problems and I wanna be able to propose some restoration actions, for example. Um, that there will be plenty of help built in of how to do that. Um, and you don't need to be, you know, some real expert, um, nor, you know, have a really deep understanding of every single input that the, you know, your subject matter experts put in up front here. Um, so hopefully that helps. But the other thing I tell people is, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Um, so, you know, I'll just kind of go up here. Uh, Sorry, I got to back up a ways. Um, here is where I wanted to get. Okay, so mm -hmm. if you remember here, this idea of I can start something really simple. You know, all I want to do right now is figure out, you know, how well my targets are represented in existing protected areas. Um, and then again, you know, maybe get into the planning phase where I just say, well, what if we put a, you know, another protected area here, here, and here, you know, what does that give me? Um, so you can start off simple and then you can say, well, okay, 
but ultimately it really does matter what's going on there. I mean, how viable are those things going to be based on existing stressors, neighboring stressors, having offsite effects, et cetera, et cetera. You start to move into the more sophisticated modeling capabilities in VISTA, but you, you can definitely do that over time. That, that, that sounds good. Am I still unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, could you go back to that slide or just that? I'm sorry. The, the main one? This no, one? the uh, quick start. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. this one? Yep. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of questions queued up, but real quickly, uh, ecosystem service representation, valuation and attribute, and, uh, and so forth. You know, that's really a work in progress in so many ways. I've never been really happy particularly with valuation, but also with the representation of ecosystem services. I, I think it's kind of stick figure right now. Um, you got something new on the horizon that's going to kick it up a notch? Well, again, this is where I'm saying this is, is toolkit interoperation. Um, we're not planning on any functions in Vista where you would model um, ecosystem service, uh, either you know where it exists or the value of it. Um, coming off of different places, um, you know, our our sense about areas like that, about things like hydrology. There's, you know, whole industries built around figuring that out. You know, whole disciplines figuring that out and developing tools around that. So it's much better for us to let them be the innovators, and then we um, connect with those tools um, at those times. And again, it's uh, you know, be our expectation uh, that you know, uh, people that, you know, maybe only heard of it, but they don't know much about it, just dive right in that they'd want to be working with people that actually know what they're doing with that kind of thing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, really looks like a great tool, by the way. Thanks. All right. Okay. I'll just pop um, this one back up. Okay. And there was another question. Um, and Paul, mute too. Okay. Um, under area prioritization, is there scope to include a multi-criteria assessment type approach as an alternative to the Marxan slash irreplaceability approach? In highly fragmented slash modified landscape, one typically requires all remaining natural habitat to achieve your conservation goals. Therefore, Marxan does not help, but a multi-criteria assessment might be more appropriate. Um, well, I think, um that's an important suggestion. We have been working with some folks that are definitely in that situation where they're, you know, there's very little that hasn't been protected. So that's that's still part of their scheme, um, but mostly they're thinking about uh, more of how do you optimize for where you do restoration work. Um, so I'll confess, I'm not strong in the tools around that. So. Um, would be happy to, you know, have that person make some more specific, if they've got more specific suggestions um, on it. Otherwise, we'll capture the um, the general suggestion and we'll dig into that. Um, I'll actually, I unmuted. Philip, are you, are you able to, oh, actually, let's see. Philip, are you able to talk? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Um, I, I don't have any specific suggestions for you, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I haven't dabbled much with uh, multi-criteria assessment, but yeah, just finding it, yeah, I mean, I'm a, a long time Mark Sand user, um, and yeah, I'm uh, finding it less and less functional as landscapes get more and more modified. So yeah, you want to optimize management interventions, not necessarily select a subset of sites. So, um, but yeah, I mean, generally, I think in conservation planning globally, people are still kind of in the marks and kind of mode rather than looking beyond that. So yeah, I don't have any concrete suggestions for you, I'm afraid. Okay. Well, I, I do agree with you. I, I think that's um, really where things are heading. Now, certainly when you are in more multi-objective planning, uh, where there are still those decisions about, you know, where we're going to accommodate a large variety of human activities, you know, we still need to, to do that zoning sort of approach. But then when you're focused on your conservation areas um, and where you're going to spend, uh, you know, rare uh, dollars on management action, 
um, you know, more help on that uh, would certainly be really useful. And um, yeah, I guess I, I haven't seen a lot of great solutions on that yet, but um, well, luckily we have an endowment, so we plan to be around indefinitely. And as uh, science develops around that, hopefully we can provide more and more help. Uh, thanks, Philip. Great, thanks. And that's all we have right now. If anybody has any other questions, uh, go ahead and send them. And I realized I was remiss at the start of the webinar not to introduce Patrick as the founder of the EBM Tools Network. Uh, this was uh, largely Patrick's brainchild uh, to have a network around ecosystem-based management tools. And so I, sh I should have mentioned that at the very beginning. Well, thanks, Sarah. And we're Sarah was was very close behind me um, in uh, taking over on uh, the heavy lifting on it. And uh, even though Sarah doesn't work for NatureServe anymore, we're still happy that uh, we're all part of the same team. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And I think that's all we've got, Patrick. So. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, people. Uh, just A, for your time um, and giving us the input through the polls and then the other additional um, suggestions you put in. We will take it all to heart uh, very much. And um, it's been uh, great. And we're going to definitely look forward to um, future uh, EBM tool demos, um, hopefully, uh, w you know, beginning with um, introducing Vista 4.0 uh, when we've got something. I think we'll probably do one when we've got that beta ready to show off and recruit some beta testers. Fantastic. Okay. We look forward to it. And thank you very much, Patrick. And thank you to everyone who was attending and gave feedback. Um, it seems like a very productive session. Thanks all. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.